Hello, I'm Mike Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where I have back as a guest, Dr. Jorge Azaza. He's an orthopedic surgeon here in Baton Rouge. I did one show with him a while back and this is a follow-up show. He's gonna talk about the surgical procedures that are available to orthopedic surgeons or neurosurgeons when they work on someone's spine. He's gonna tell us about needle procedures, but if they don't work, they move into more major surgeries. They can do it either through a scope or they actually cut you open pretty big depending on what the surgery is. So join us on the next Legal Lines with Dr. Jorge Azaza. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Document your claim. What do I mean? Whenever you present a claim, whether it's for injuries in an automobile collision or for a breach of contract case or a business claim, it all boils down to documentation and evidence. For example, when you go to trial, basically both sides are presenting their evidence of what they believe to be their case. For example, also, if you're involved in an automobile collision, document the event. Talk to all the parties who are involved. Get their names, address, contact information, insurance info. Talk to the witnesses on the scene. Also get their contact information. Take photographs with the phones we all have these days. Everybody can take a picture and that paints a thousand words. So document your claim. The Legal Lines tip from me, Lock Meredith, to you is document the claim. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Hello, welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Lock Meredith. I'm very pleased to have back on the show orthopedic surgeon Jorge Azaza. Dr. Azaza, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you very much. You know, last time we talked, we spoke about uh, basically the options that are available to orthopedic physicians. Um, to, to try and help folks. Before we do it though, kind of give folks a quick outline of your educational background and history. Yes. So they know what you're talking about. Right, well, I uh, went to medical school in Columbia, South America, validated my diploma uh, in um, 1982, and then came to Tulane University and did a residency in orthopedics uh, for five years. Then I did a fellowship in pediatric orthopedics at Children's Hospital in New Orleans, and then I did a fellowship in spine surgery. After that, I started working mostly in spine because it was kind of my passion, and uh, went back to South America, practiced for two years there, came to the United States, Louisville, Kentucky, first, and then in Baton Rouge since 1996. And, and have license uh, at various times in what, sound like five or six states? <laughs> well, as you go around the United States, you need a license for each state. So Georgia, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, Indiana, uh, I Amazing. didn't have a license. All and then you've those. actually taught, you sp speak internationally. Yes, I, uh, one of the things I like the most is to kind of read and research about my field. And uh, yes, we have done a lot of uh, research uh, papers uh, published in major uh, journals, uh, chapters of books. And of course, when you do the papers and the research, you have to present it to your peers. So I've been in uh, Europe several times, South America and Brazil. Uh, we've done some presentations in Istanbul. Uh, we have done posters in uh, Asia. Um, Good gosh. And of course here in the U.S. And in the U.S. Multiple times. <laughs> uh, as I, I summarize it by saying over, perhaps over 20 years of, of education to finally start practicing and then you've practiced uh, over 20 years now, privately. Yeah, gonna be pretty much 20 years and this you, year in Baton Rouge. And home. then you have privileges at all the, the hospitals here. Yes, I have privileges in the hospitals here and some in, in New Orleans and some in Monroe still have privileges. And you've done, what, thousands of surgeries? Yes, uh, that's true. I mean, probably throughout my career, thousands of surgeries and, and the reason the reason I, I wanted the folks to know that is bottom line is you know what you're talking about so let's kind of dive into it you said you focus on spinal injuries and uh, the process that you use to try and figure out what what the problem is that the person's suffering from how do you describe how you do that to the folks quickly well the the most important part is to try to find out what happened to the patient and that's called the history when you start hurting is related to a traumatic event. No, there is no trauma. I start having fevers. Then you start thinking about infections. No, it's just something that gradually occur. Wake me up at night. Then you say, well, maybe something else. Maybe tumors. I don't know. So all these things we start thinking in our mind. 
uh, how to make a diagnosis. Mostly, we achieve that diagnosis on the, on the uh, history. Uh, the physical exam kind of confirmed that. And then we sometimes need some testing to confirm or get a little better orientation of what's going on with the patient's back or neck. So cetera. what are the tests you use typically? So we use, the first one and is easier because most doctors, orthopedic doctors have it in their office is the x-rays. And then you take plain x-rays on flexion extension to see the stability of Meaning the spine. moving the spine around. Flexion, extension, back and forth. And then if all that is okay, then you go and proceed with what we call the conservative treatment. So the conservative treatment usually uh, is oriented to rehabilitate the muscles, rehabilitate the uh, ligaments in the spine and consist on physical therapy. And then also consist on decreasing the inflammation of some people have trauma or inflammation there, arthritis that gotten uh, upset by a, a particular event. And then we use anti-inflammatory medications. And then the muscles are hurting too, and they have a spasm, we could muscle spasm. Then the patients, some of them are in severe pain, and then we have to use narcotics for pain. Got it. Okay? Most of the people that have injuries on the spine or spine problems, simple low back pain, they will get better in six weeks. And we have to understand that back pain alone is the second cause of consultation to any doctor. Interesting. The first will be common cold. So we can't do x-rays so and MRIs everybody on everybody. everybody has back problems. So got it. Okay. And so if, the, if they don't heal up within a short period of time, what's next? So if in six weeks you're not better, then we consider, well, maybe something else is going on in there that we need to know. And then the best test today to find out a little bit more about the spine will be an MRI. Okay. Why? Because it's not invasive. You don't need needles. You don't need... A lot of they're not cutting stuff. your skin exactly, and it doesn't hurt as long as you can hold still. Most people can have an MRI. Contraindications: metal in your eye, metal in your brain, specifically iron parts. Uh, so because they, it works on a magnet. Exactly, it works on the magnet. Or if you have a pacemaker, or if you have something in your spinal canal like a stimulator of some kind, of a pump or a trochlear implant for your ear, things like that, we can't do it. So anything metal in your body, you're not going to do an MRI. You have to tell the doctor because some metals can be compatible with the MRI, some others don't. Okay. Now, uh, as I understand, the x-rays pretty much show the bones. The MRI starts so showing the soft tissues uh, better than a regular x-ray does. Is that cr accurate? Yes. The x-ray mm -hmm. is, imagine a light that can penetrate everything and give you a picture on the other side, and you can see all the insides. So it's based on what stopped the light from getting in the other side, and it gives you a picture. The MRI used the chemistry of your body. So uh, the hydrogen molecules uh, get some kind of spin with the magnet as the magnet charge and get in uh, on and off and the computer will read that and then most of the things that we know have hydrogen. Water, fatty acids, uh, bone, iron, all these things they combine with water in general, and then we can have a picture of pretty much what is going on inside. So uh, I've also heard of the CT scan, obviously, uh, and personally experienced it. So what is the difference between a CT scan and an MRI? Well, the CT scan has radiation, so there is so many you can have uh, because the radiation gets accumulated. The MRI don't have radiation. Okay. It's, a, it's a magnetic field. Right. And then uh, is there a better quality for one or the other for certain structures? Well, absolutely. If you want to see a, uh, and the bone fractures, the CT scan is much better than the MRI. Okay, and that's probably because it's doing the radiation versus the, the soft tissue. Water, Correct, and the, the MRI is much better for the soft tissues, tumors, inflammation, and, and um, other things. Okay, and so you also use dye to help make the pictures look better, so you can on, see better? On the MRI, we can do that, and we use gadolinium. Okay. We'll continue this on the next segment. This is Locked Med with Legal Lines. My special guest, Dr. Jorge Azaza, orthopedic. We'll be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines tip for you. Never give a recorded statement or give a written statement without first seeing an attorney. Remember, you can always see an attorney for the most part free on the first visit. Get educated. Knowledge is power. Learn what the consequences are of the decision. Learn what the issues are. And then if you feel necessary, give the recorded statement. Remember in Louisiana, we have what's called comparative fault. 
Typically what that means is a judge or jury is required to divide fault up amongst all the players to decide who pays what in damages. Recorded statements are often used in depositions and trials to argue that the victim or the plaintiff is partially at fault for their own damages to reduce the amount that they collect. So my legal lines tip from me, Lock Mayor, to you is don't give a recorded statement. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Lock Meredith, and again, very pleased to have back on the show Dr. Jorge Azaza. He's an orthopedic surgeon that specializes in spinal injuries. Dr. Azaza, we talked about the patient who's suffered about six weeks and they healed up using conservative care, which basically means, you know, meds and some physical therapy and take it easy, sounds like. But it, let's say they, they don't heal up in six weeks. You've now run one of the typical tests, which would be an MRI, well, x-rays, MRI, CT scans, sometimes with and without the dye to help see the structures better. There's a couple other, maybe uh, nerve conduction or such, discogram. But uh, let's say one of those tests is positive. What are your options then for the patient? Yes, so, so let's say some of the, the MRI came back with a herniated disc, which is the most common thing that we see uh, or we look for in the MRI in patients that have low back pain and refer pain to the legs okay. or arms in the case of the neck. Uh, well, depending on the size of the disc and the area where the symptoms are, if that correlates with the imaging, in other words, if the patient have right arm pain and the disc is also herniated on the right side and it looks like it's the same nerves that are appear to be compromised, then we go through a little bit more aggressive treatment and that will be uh, we call it minimal invasive, but it will be the injections. So you can block that nerve and put some medicine there to do two things. One, relieve the patient of the pain, and the other one to confirm that we're in the right place. So it has a diagnostic purpose. Also. So it's very important that people who do that test can give us that particular answers. Because I don't want to stick you twice or three times trying to find out where the pain is when you already have stuck have been stuck before uh, trying to relieve your pain. So it should be done in a very organized fashion and okay. it should be documented what part of the spine is, is, is injected. Then the second part after that injection is the injection help and the patient continue to have symptoms and they do not get better for a long period of time. You don't want to be having these injections every six weeks. You want to have an injection like this maybe every year, every six months. And if you have great relief with that, most people will continue to do that. But once the injection proves that the things are right and the right area is diagnosed and the MRI is also confirming the problem, then you can go ahead and think about fixing it more permanently. Now the MRI, the testing that you use, is it correct? Isn't it that the, uh, the tests don't always identify the injury? It might look okay, but, but it may not actually show that there is an, uh, a problem? But that is possible. And then sometimes we have equivocal findings on the MRI, and then we we'll have to go and do more invasive tests like a okay. monogram CT scan. Because remember that the MRI is like a reading of the chemistry inside of you. And sometimes some parts of the body, if you have braces in your mouth or have some kind of metal in your shoulder or hip uh, or screws in certain parts, then it can give you a little distortion of the, of the images. Or if you move, then okay. also too. All right, so, so what additional uh, tests would you do if you said you first do some blocks, which maybe last, what, weeks, months at best? Yes. All right, and then you would use the ESI's epidural steroid injections that hopefully last, what, a year or so? The ideal situation, yes, that okay. it allows to heal whatever is broken, and then you can heal while you don't have as much pain. Got it. Pain okay, but if, if after those procedures, it doesn't, the pain comes back, they still hurt horribly, what do you do? Well, if, if the pain continues to come back, means that the epidural injection is blocking part of the issue, but you may have an instability, you may have still compression of the nerve, you may still have something growing in there that is not making you get better. Okay. So the next test after that will be to, you already confirmed the problem, is to go ahead either, if, if everything is clear, fix it. If it's not clear and you think that maybe something growing in the bone, then you get bone scans. If you think that uh, you need something else like finding the anatomy of the fracture, then you go ahead and do CT scans. And sometimes you have heard about discograms, injection of the disc itself with some medicine and see if the pain is coming from the disc itself 
if there is no compression of any. So you make nerves. sure before you cut somebody open that you know that you're going to get the right pain generator. Correct. There is no point on guessing doing a spine okay. surgery. And I see you've got all kinds of models here. Can you kind of show the folks real quick uh, on any of your models? You refer to the spine and the discs uh, and, and if there's a problem where the disc breaks open or bulges. Well, let's get this one uh, in here. I don't know. So the, the, the disc is the ones that are in between the white stuff. So it's, it's like a jelly donut between the vertebrae. Correct, and allowed you, to, allowed you to have some motion in the spine. And certainly you can inject the disc or you can inject the nerves or you can inject the joints back here. Okay. And that will give you where the problem is coming from. Because if it's from the disc and you treat the joint here, it's not going to work. And if it's the disc uh, and, uh, and you, that you're treating over here and it happened that you have a fracture up here, then it's not going to work either. Okay. And that's the diagnostic process. That's the diagnostic process to do the right surgery okay. on the right people. And so if you, you've done these things, you've confirmed the area, it hadn't solved the problem, the body didn't heal up, your only options now are to cut the person open, right? Well, we have minimally invasive stuff that we can do. Uh, there are some stuff, uh, some uh, new technology that can allow you as well. You remember how you do it in the knee, that you put a little tube with a camera and you can see the ruptured part and you can trim it out and, and uh, clean it up. It, well, we can do the same thing in the spine right now. So it's the orthoscopic procedure. Right. You can put an arthroscope, which is, arthro means in the joint, but this time it's in the spine, so spinal scope, let's put it that way. Okay. And then you can see what's going on in there. You already identified in the MRI that there's a disc herniation. You can clip some of the ligaments, allow the scope and camera go farther in. You can identify the nerves. You can push the nerves aside, find the piece of disc that is compressing that nerve, and take it out. So on the spine model you just had, uh, I saw that a disc was herniated on one side. Would that be, would it enable you to demonstrate what you would do, for example, to remove this red bulge here on that disc? So, so the, the main thing here is, yes, so you can put the scope not in the middle of the spine here, because it's so hard to get there, the scope doesn't bend. You're going to put this, the scope straight right lateral here, okay, and in the disc itself and pull it out. X-ray will tell you where you are, at the same time you can see the nerve, it's a different type of structure. You can see the disc because we can put a needle in the disc and inject some dye that is blue. It's called indigo carmine and then you, the, the blue it doesn't stain the nerve and it doesn't stain the other parts, the bone or anything. So whatever is blue there, you start removing and you start seeing the structures and you decompress the nerve. And so when you do this through the scope, bottom line is you have a tiny hole versus a giant laceration of some sort. So let's talk about that on the final segment. Absolutely. This is Locke Mayer with Legal Lines. My very special guest, Dr. Jorge Azaza. We'll be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines tip for you. Never sign a settlement document without first seeing an attorney. You often can see an attorney for free, at least on the first visit. Knowledge is power. Learn what it is that you're signing and the consequences of signing that document are. Remember, once you sign a settlement document, regardless of whether it's contractual, business claim, or personal injury claim, it's over. You will no longer have rights. You can no longer file a lawsuit. You better know what your consequences are. You better make sure you're being fully compensated. And remember, oftentimes, there are obligations that you have once you sign that contract. So from me, Locke Meredith, to you, the Legal Lines tip is never sign a settlement document without first seeing an attorney. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, very pleased to have back on the show Dr. Jorge Azaza. He's an excellent uh, orthopedic surgeon here in Baton Rouge. We're talking about spinal surgery, and you've done, you know, thousands. Uh, so you just described the orthoscopic, uh, the it's scopic okay. procedure, yeah. where you're using a scope and you're looking at a screen and you have these little bitty tools that you're using. Is it a robot or is your hand holding it? No, it's my hand holding it. So it is is complicated and required to learn and get familiar with the procedure. That's the major thing. The curve, the learning curve is high. It's like driving a stiff shift car. You can ride in the passenger side forever and never learn how to drive until you sit in the driver's seat. So it's complicated 
initially because you do it a lot of times in the cadaver, many times go see people and learn and learn until you get to do it. You put your needle first in the lateral approach, like the disc herniation we saw, and then we push a dilator through, uh, push a, a little wire through that needle, remove the needle and push dilator, and then you push your scope in there, and, and the cannula and the scope. And then you can see and you know where you are. So in essence, you're not cutting anything, you're just we kind make of a little spreading cut, open. We make a little cut in the skin, that's it. Right. And then if we go and do the, the disc herniation that is in the middle, in there. Usually we can do it very well in L5-S1 because it has a bigger window right here. Okay. Then and you don't use S1 is the lowest the uh, lowest disc. You don't use a needle anymore. You just cut the skin and with the dilator along that is is blunt, you get to the bone and then you cut the little ligament and put the camera in there. But then you're holding the tube and the camera with one hand and with the other hand you are trying to pick the things there. And your head is looking at the screen there. And then your feet have to go ahead and do some of the stuff like burning some of the bleeding vessels uh, with a special ultrasonic um, uh, device. And then you have to pull it out, turn it, doing it, and you're not looking directly at your thing. So it's something it's that a requires process. a little bit of process. Okay. But then where, why you don't use everything through the scope? Well, the reason is simple. If you have a fracture, the scope only, only measures eight millimeters, and the hole where you work is only 4.2 millimeters. You can't put something like this inside And your what body. you're pointing to is a cage, a piece of uh, instrumentation that you use. Correct. So if you have a fracture here compressing the spinal canal, you have to remove part of that fracture. This is in this thoracic spine, and you have to replace the anterior part, and you have to secure with this instrumentation. This Scope, which is like your pen, it, it won't allow you to do that. Right. So we still have to do open surgeries with the right indications. You see? So Very interesting. So it, for this particular example where you have the cage and, and the, the plates and screws holding it in place, why would you uh, choose instrumentation over uh, more of a uh, scopic pr process? It's just required because of the nature of the injury? Right. You, you have to remove big pieces of bone and you're going to have a void that you have to fill out with something that is not going to fill to fit through the scope. Okay. So you have to see the whole anatomy. So you have to open up. So let's talk about the types of, of surgeries you do. People hear about discectomies, laminectomies, fusions, uh, and the various ways that you can do a fusion. How, how do you do the discectomy? Well, the discectomies can be done from the back by removing part of the bone. Okay, and it's usually more commonly done in the lumbar spine like that because in the thoracic and in the cervical, the spinal cord is there. You can't get through the disc. So the cervical is your neck in essence, and thoracic the, is your middle chest. back, mm -hmm. and then your lumbar is the lower back. lower back. So in the lower back, there are a bunch of nerves that you can kind of retract a little bit and get to the front part. So you can do discectomy from the back, only in the lumbar. In the thoracic, you have to do discectomy through the side, in the neck, you cannot do discectomy through the side because you have the vertebral artery and the nerves there, so you have to go through the front. So that's why we choose the approach. Now, when you do a laminectomy, well, you do a laminectomy if the posterior part is pressing on the nerves. Now, explain, explain, explain to folks what part of this model. Uh, this is posterior, okay. and this is the lamina, and removing that, like in this case, is missing here, is laminectomy. Okay, and the reason it's removed is why? The reason you remove that is because there is a compression or a tumor or something in the posterior part of the spine that is compressing the spine. So you got to get to it. Right. If the compression is posterior, it's harder Meaning to get it from the front. So you go where the problem is. Got it. Okay. Now, when, when a laminectomy is done, uh, if there's not a fusion, does the spine start becoming unstable or is there always a fusion when you do a laminectomy? No, not necessarily always a fusion. If a patient is young and is very athletic and is uh, very active, you want to stabilize the spine because it's going to get bad in a few months or years. If the patient is already an elderly patient in the 80s or 90s and is not that uh, active, then you can leave the laminectomy alone and the surgical procedure is less invasive and Got less it. extended. So the laminectomy is basically cutting away part of the backbone in lay terms. Yeah. And, and the discectomy is cutting a, a part of the disc, which is the shock absorber deli nut, uh, jelly donut, between the two vertebrae that might be hitting either on the cord or the nerves. Correct. Okay. 
So what other type of surgeries are, we, we mentioned the, the fusion. Explain to folks what the fusion is. So the fusion is basically to uh, make one segment of the spine, one vertebra and the other vertebra, taking the disc out or putting bone graft here to heal together and don't move anymore. So instead of two joints, you've got one. You will have like a one segment. One vertebra, one instead, vertebra of two. instead of two. Okay. Or you can do three or four, depending what you need. So uh, what is the medium that you use to join those two separate vertebrae together? Bone or, or instrumentation or both or what? Okay. So the instrumentation will hold the things together while the bone heals up. Okay. Without bone, we cannot make a fusion. So is there a better place to get the bone? You hear about use of cadaver bone versus somebody's own bone. We prefer the patient's own bone from the local laminectomy. We prefer also to aspirate the bone marrow and put it in a machine to get stem cells and other things that combine with uh, different materials, uh, biologics, will allow your own bone to grow into that. So it just is a better fusion. success rate if you use your own bone. That's the gold standard, that okay. is correct. Right. But it's expensive and it's, it's painful. Okay, and then, so you, you harvest the bone from the, the hip bone area? Or is there traditionally, a different place? Traditionally, we harvest from the hip bone, but now we try to use local bone. As we remove the facet joints, we tend to keep that bone and clean it in the back. If we remove the spinal processes, here we tend to keep it in the back. As we remove the lamina, we keep it in the back. All right, and so in the that, in, that in combination with the biologics will help. Excellent, Dr. Zaza, thank you so much for You're making it back welcome. on the show. As usual, we're out of time. This is Locke Metter with Legal Lines, fantastic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Jorge Zaza. See you next time. Thank you very much. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. If you have to hire a lawyer, and I hope you don't, but if you do, hire a lawyer that you like, that you trust, and who specializes in your area of need. In these days, with all the laws we have, lawyers for the most part now specialize. They specialize in contracts, defense, business, personal injury, all kinds of areas of the law. So when you interview with a lawyer, ask him, does he specialize in the area of your need? Has he tried the cases? Has he been successful? And of course, how does he charge you? Is his fee hourly? Is it a percentage of the case if he recovers? What exactly does he charge? So my legal lines tip from me, Locke Meredith, to you is, if you have to hire a lawyer, hire one you like, you trust, and who specializes in your area of need. This has been Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith.